Coming up on this episode of Faz TV. It's never too early to start discussing farm succession. How community support has helped one couple become crofters. Why safety should always be the number one farm priority. And we're at Air Mart where trade is buoyant. It's best to approach family succession early, in a calm, structured manner, allowing everyone in the family an opportunity to share their hopes and expectations. Advice from professionals can help find the best way forward for the family and the business. My name is Margot McGill and I'm an agricultural solicitor. Um, I work with Lockhart Solicitors and Air. I've um, been a partner there now for 10 years. Um, I head up the agricultural and estates team, which I really enjoy. Um, I am also an accredited specialist in agricultural law. So I've been accredited by the Law Society as a specialist in agricultural law now for over five years. Um, that's something I'm very proud of because there's actually over about, only about 20 of us across the whole of Scotland um, and I'm the only one in air. So it's agricultural law is very much my bag and that's what I really enjoy. We farm here at Shackle Hill Farm at Moss Blowen. Uh, we purchased Shackle Hill in 2004. Um, it was initially a beef rearing unit and myself and my husband both had other jobs. But it was um, in 2016, December 2016, we decided to put on a dairy of our own. So we have installed two A3 Lely robots and we now milk 100 cows through our two robots. And we have, I think, maybe in the region of about 200 young stock followers and we farm in total about 220 acres. So, yes, yeah, it's, it's a lovely spot, we, we enjoy it, we, we like it here in sunny Ayrshire. So what is succession planning and what does it mean? Stripped back to its basics, succession planning basically means that you are planning for your future. You are putting the building blocks in place which are there effectively to secure the future of you your, and your family business. Um, and it's just the very basics of making sure that you know there is a route or a forward path for your business and your farming enterprise um, and that you've thought about it and you've planned for how you wish that enterprise to be taken forward. Succession planning is key for farm businesses, primarily because I always think farming is a unique industry because you are very often working with not only one but two or sometimes three generations of the same family. So working with your father and very often your grandfather and therefore it is key to make sure that there is a direction amongst the family members in terms of how the business is going to flow um, and therefore key that succession planning happens at an early stage and, and very importantly as well because of the capital value of the assets which are tied up in farming. I mean the values of the farms, the value of the, the farming businesses. So it's key that there is a secure future for these assets. And also very pragmatically from a banking perspective because very often the banks, if they're going to continue to renew your finance on an annual basis, they like to know that there is continuity and there's a, a young team coming on behind father and mother. It's never too early to sit down and have the chats about succession planning. Um, succession planning is um, so key at any stage. People sometimes think it's not something you should think about until you're a bit older and thinking about putting a will or a power of attorney in place. But actually communicating and sitting down around the kitchen table at an early stage can just pay so like it can just pay off so much because if you involve the younger generation at an early stage and have discussions about where you want the business to go. It's amazing the opportunities that can just come out of that in terms of, well, you maybe want to expand, you maybe want to diversify, and therefore there's lots of um, you know, ideas and opportunities that can actually come out of succession planning. So the earlier you have these discussions, the better it is for everyone and indeed the business. Succession planning can be quite a daunting conversation to a lot of people and it might be in a lot of people's minds. How would you recommend starting the conversation with your family? 
succession planning can be extremely daunting, particularly for the older generation, because I think they sometimes get concerned that they're essentially going to be put out to grass. You know, they're no longer required. But their input is actually exceptionally valuable because they've got all these years of experience and, you know, they've seen it all before and they can add a lot of value to any discussion. But the key thing is to sit down round the kitchen table, keep it nice and informal, rather than having a daunting meeting in a you know, solicitor's office or accountant's office even initially can be a bit daunting. Sit down round the kitchen table and just start from the very basic premises of this is what we have, this is where we are, and what you know would you like to achieve, where do you want to be, and make sure you've got the whole family that are involved in the business there, sons or daughters, because nowadays obviously the daughters are just as key in many farming businesses, um, and make sure everybody sits down and you actually have a discussion about what the younger generation want to achieve, what the older generation want to achieve, and sometimes actually quite surprisingly, they are quite close in terms of what they want. Clearly there are some instances where there can be a bit of divergence, but that's why it's important to communicate so that can all be discussed and explored at an early or as early a date as possible and then hopefully a solution can be worked through um, by just you know adding advice from third parties or whoever but just key to communicate. Would you recommend bringing in a third party like a, a professional like yourself? Yes I would definitely recommend bringing in a third party um, advisor um, obviously I think I'm going to say that I'm a solicitor, that's what I do but it can add so much value to the actual discussions that the family have um, we are professionals and therefore we have our own key skills that we can add to the discussions in terms of well this is the legal position if you want to do X or Y this is how you set up a partnership, this is how you set up a company so we can provide our expertise to the meeting um, likewise in that kind of situation, I would also very much recommend not only having a, an agricultural solicitor, somebody that's well versed on agricultural law, but you also have your accountant present at that meeting as well because they are very good at advising on the tax implications, any capital gains implications, entrepreneur relief, when's maybe the, the key time to actually think about father taking a step back or retiring and therefore the joint advice, legally and accounting-wise, is key. Likewise, advice from you know agricultural consultants is very important as well because you need to get a flavour for where the business is at financially, structure-wise. It's always good to take advice. You don't need to follow the advice, but it's good to take advice because then you're as, as well informed as you possibly can be before you potentially make decisions which you know will have a, a very lasting effect on you, your family and your business. One part of succession planning is creating a will. So what is a will? A will is a very important document. A will reflects your testamentary intention. So a will basically sets down exactly how you wish to leave your worldly goods. So it is very important because without a will, it's the law of intestacy which would apply. So that is set down in law how your assets would be passed to the next generation if you don't have a will. So a will is exceptionally key, particularly for farmers, because you want to be sure in your own mind exactly how your farming assets are being left. Um, so a will, I cannot emphasise enough how important it is. Even just the basics, you know, in your will, the first thing you do is appoint your executors. Now, that is key because if you don't leave a will, the law doesn't presume that your wife will be your executor. You have to go to court to get your executor appointed. That takes additional stress and money, adds time scale. So it is exceptionally important to have a will in place. It's never too early to bring somebody like myself in, um, especially for succession planning and indeed if you're thinking of wills, because from a farming perspective a will can be even more important than normal because it's key with farming families that you know where the farm is being left and your, your estate it cannot be subject to a legal, well it could be subject to a legal rights claim but you want to make sure that it's, it's, it's covered so that there is no chance of the assets going in the manner other than which you want them to go so that the key thing there is making sure that you check when you're doing a will and you're a farmer that you check how the assets are held. So if the asset is held by the, the farmer as an individual, 
then that is, you know, that is entirely fine. The, the concern sometimes are if the farm is held as a partnership or by the company, because if you have a disgruntled child or member of the family that doesn't accept what's in their will, then they can claim the legal right, their legal right in the deceased estate, and that right entitles them to claim on the movable assets. Now, the movable assets of any estate are usually just money, cash, stock and machinery. But if you hold the family farm in a partnership or a company, then a share in that partnership or company is a movable asset. So it essentially allows a disgruntled beneficiary or disgruntled child to claim a share of the farm if it's not held properly. So it is exceptionally key for farmers to ensure when they carry out the succession planning process, preparing a will, etc., that they check how the assets are held. So what do farmers nearing retirement need to think about? Well, if you're a farmer nearing retirement, you need to think basically on your business structure. What, what is the structure of your business at that point? Have you already got your sons or daughters even into the business? Is there a, you know, are there successors there willing to come on board and take, it, take on the business? Um, if they are, then are you essentially just going to step back and then basically pass on your capital. So very key to take tax advice at that point as well, just to understand the most efficient ways of being able to pass on the capital and indeed assets to the next generation. Um, and also whether you wish to do so in life or in death, because there are different tax implications for doing it, passing on the farm in life and death. And essentially at the present time, you know, passing the farm on in death is actually the most tax efficient way to do it because you get the benefit of the inheritance tax relief, your agricultural property relief and business property relief. But a lot of people prefer to transfer it during life because they know the next generation it's firmly within their you know their scope they've they've got the confidence then that the asset is theirs and they can take pride and then take the asset forward so yeah a lot of different issues to consider when you are thinking about retiring if there isn't the immediately obvious succession path there then your options are always such you know you can sell the family farm or indeed you could rent the family farm out um, one thing which is becoming, or I know it's being promoted, I was going to say it's becoming more popular, but um, maybe with larger scale farms is contract farming, so that if you don't have an immediate successor, then you can contract farm. That's again popular. Um, but it just, it just depends on the immediate line of succession. And that's why it can be very key at that point to take advice from your advisors in terms of what your different options are, what the market's like for potentially selling. Just now it's a great market, you know, honestly, that we've not seen values like this for, for years. Um, but it's important to take advice from your advisors at that point, both legal, accounting and farm consultancy. Having constructive discussions about succession can be a weight off the shoulders, improve well-being and encourage future discussions about the farm business. For more information, please visit faz.scot. In the northwest of Skye, Robert MacDonald and family run Uiganish Farm, where farm safety is an important part of day-to-day -day life for the family. My name is Robert MacDonald, uh, uh, Uiganish Farm here just now, just beside the shores of Loch Beggan. We're a traditional hill farm, family-run hill farm. We have about 850 breeding ewes and uh, 40 head of cattle. Health and safety is the most important thing on any farm. We here, we work with tractors and we work with the ATVs. And at all times we try and, and assess whatever situation we're, we're working in, that, uh, that, that health and safety is the priority, no matter the job that we are doing. To ensure the risk of an accident is very low, maintenance of machinery and ensuring safety measures are in place are very important to Robert. With the tractors and, and, and especially at the, at the silage time, all the guards have to be in place. All the machinery has to be well serviced and, and to make sure that they, everything's in, in, in its proper running order. With the, with the quad bike, which uh, we use a lot on the farm, uh, just making sure that, that uh, it's well maintained, well serviced and that uh, everybody wears a helmet when they're, when they're using the quad bike. A helmet is of great importance. And, and uh, just that where we do go with a quad bike, that we know that everybody who's on the quad knows that uh, where the designated track is. 
and to just to just to avoid the the dangers that are all around. It's so important that the, that you read the manual and the instructions, and especially if putting the guards on, as I say, on, on the tractors and the farm machinery. For the quad bike, it, it it it's just a question of being sensible and 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 making sure that you you know how to how how to use it properly, and and you know where to go and where not to go, and just being just being sensible. For Robert, a near miss involving his grandson changed their perspective on the importance of farm safety with children. It was lambing time, and as you know, lambing time is a busy time, it's an intensive time. And uh, I had my grandson Sorley sitting on the quad bike with me as we were loading sheep and lambs from the shed out to the fields. And so I left him sitting on the quad bike, I left, I left the quad bike running and I forgot to knock it out of gear. And while we were loading the sheep and lambs, he pressed the accelerator and the bike shot forward. Thankfully, no accident occurred, but it absolutely shook me just how quickly an accident can occur. Following the near miss, the family implemented changes on the farm that would allow children to be involved in a safe manner, especially when machinery is being used. It's very, very important and, and the thing that we try to drum into the children is that when the tractors and, and, and the other machinery is moving, that they are not allowed anywhere near. The only time that they can come near the, the, the machinery is when, that, uh, when the tractor and the quad bike has stopped, it's been turned off, switched off and then they can come. But uh, I think it, 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 as, as children and grandchildren grow up in a farm, it, it, they have to know these rules and these set rules have to be taught to them. And uh, again, it's, it's just a question of, of drumming it into them and for the farmer themselves to just to, to adhere to these rules at all times. So what are Robert's top tips for safety on the farm? I think that the guards are maintained on farm machinery. That's of such importance, especially in the tractors and the, and, and the bailers and whatnot. Uh, for the quad bike, that, that you wear a helmet at all times and that when you are finished with it, you take the key out of it. Same with the tractor so that nobody can get into it. It's vitally important that farm machinery is maintained and know myself on the quad bike that uh, uh, keeping the brakes right is, uh, it, can be a, it can be a lifesaver really. Uh, that's of great importance. Having a mobile phone with you, letting somebody know where you are and roughly what time they can expect you back at and just, as I said before, just letting the children know their boundaries and, and uh, that when farm machinery is being operated, that they are not allowed to come near. At times you can, see, you can see the helmet far enough, but the thing is to remember, and we always have to remember, uh, if you have an accident, that helmet can save your life. And I, and I know that has happened in, in, in circumstances, and not to me personally, but I know of people who that, just by wearing that helmet on that particular day, it saved their life. Health and safety has to be the number one priority on any farm. You've only got to get it wrong once and it can either disable you for life or even worse. So it has to be the number one priority. Hami Uans Tolliju, Gilshiva Shahaju, Erwa Hopriask, will agree on the charter as Jirich Mahashiva Kopper, Le Karapat to be Jirich Kapitunia Fechkawach, as Katara Hulitunia Nara. Welcome to the, onto the farm today. I'm very happy that it's, a, it's, it's such a sunny day and just to remember that when we are working with any machinery, eh, just to be careful and for everybody to stay safe. We're on Sky to meet crofting new entrants Jake and Aoife with daughter Corin who are crofting at Kildonan. They're giving us an insight into how they got their croft and how the local community has helped them along their journey. My name's Jake Sales. We're new entrants to crofting here in Kildonan. Our croft is known as Dunflashadder Croft because that's the name of our house, which is just a bit further up the hill here. And yeah, uh, learning as we go. Hi, I'm Aoife and a uh, new entrant crofter. We have a flock of a, coming up for 60 Hebridean sheep, so native breeds, hardy for the, uh, the rough ground that we have here and, and great fleeces as well. I have no background whatsoever in agriculture, grew up in a rural area but um, with, with no experience with any livestock or anything. Um, when I moved to Skye, coming up for eight years ago to move in with my partner Jake, he um, has always had an interest in agriculture and always wanted to have a croft. 
How did you source your croft and what procedures did you go through? We were very lucky, I uh, have to say, in the scale of new entrants because we had friends and neighbours who actually owned the croft here um, able to mentor us before we took it over um, and that really helped an awful lot. It meant that before we actually had ownership of the flock we were able to do some of the main tasks in the crofting year with them and also we had a bit of um, backup and advice when we needed it. Well the first thing for us was obviously making sure that we had um, ourselves registered as animal keepers. After that it was a case of agreeing a price uh, for what we were purchasing off the initial crofters uh, and then making a plan with our vets that we decided to use so that we knew what we were going to do throughout the year in regards to animal health and medicine and such like. Um, and then other than that, an awful lot of questions, um, working with other people um, and trying to work out the best way to croft that suits our lifestyle and the way that we have to earn our main incomes as well. With the, the sort of legislative and paperwork side of taking on the croft, it was quite a complicated case here because um, there are multiple landowners um, of this one croft, but we are only going to be full tenants of part of it, which is what our friends own. So for us, the process was getting the croft registered, which included um, making sure that all of the landowners agreed on the maps that we produced so that there wasn't any complication after submission to the crofting commission. And having official tenancy, it gives us security for our own investment, but also it means that we're eligible for certain types of grant that you have to be full tenant or, or owner occupier for. So for things, if there's areas needed fencing and we, we have no water supply here. So at the moment we're, you know, bringing it in every day in um, gallon buckets kind of thing. So getting a water supply and things like that are investments that we can make going forward with the security of tenancy. Now that you're up and running, what have you been producing from the croft? Crofting on Skye is generally a store producing area, but of course with Hebridean sheep, we're not exactly going to be competing uh, with anyone on store lambs at, at the September sales or anything. So we knew we had to go a bit of a different route. So we've decided to finish our hebs and have them slaughtered at about the 18 month range and sell them as, as finished, either butchered or whole to um, local folk but also quite a lot of chefs on the island have we've been very very lucky that they've purchased our our meat and have had really great feedback from it and uh, something else that we've been doing is again just trying to add a bit of value to what would otherwise be a very poorly priced product which is for the fleeces um, we've been making felted rugs and um, other kind of household items like tea cozies and things what are your top tips regarding croft registrations and how the croft has helped you to get to know your community? So my top tips for anyone who's about to start the process of registering a croft for, for any reason, for assignation, for purchase, decrofting, would be make sure your maps are in order um, as the first port of call. Talk to your neighbours, they know the boundaries if they've been living there for a long time. Um, that can also really preempt any issues once the, the application is in with the Commission. Um, you know, the form, form A, the, the registration form, it's fairly straightforward. And again, just talking to your neighbours, making sure that everyone agrees. Um, a really great resource is the FAS helpline, because I know that if you're not used to this kind of paperwork, it, is, it can seem really daunting, even though usually it's fairly straightforward. So definitely give them a call. They can give you some advice over the phone, but they can also, I would say more importantly, put you in touch with a local advisor who has real experience in registering crofts and all of the other applications that go alongside it. And they can really help guide you through that process with, with a lot of experience and certainly um, helped us feel not so nervous about the, about the whole procedure. I have to say it's been fantastic um, running the cross so far for many reasons. It's a, it's a great outlet for uh, stress from the normal job, which is um, an awful lot of computers and phones and such like. So great being outdoors, uh, the practical elements of the work and also getting to know our neighbours. Um, I don't think we would know most of the people on this road if it wasn't for us crofting here. Um, so that and then their help in doing many of the tasks that we need to do on the croft has just been fantastic. It's been a great 18 months really, to be honest, and can't wait for more to come.
With live sales of cattle and sheep having a good start to the season, we visited Craig Wilson Limited in Ayr for a market update. I'm Drew Carey, I'm a director auctioneer at uh, Craig Wilson Limited here at Ayr Market. I originally came from a dairy farm, uh, I was the youngest of the three brothers, so I was the, the youngest one to go and find a job, so I started auctioneering here about, when I left the school when I was 16. I uh, started the office boy and then worked my way up the ranks. Um, started selling for when I was about, about 20. Started selling the calves and now selling the sheep and the store cattle as well. Drew starts off by giving us an update on the sheep market. This year, there's that many factors. It's, it's probably working at the perfect storm now. So as farm gate prices have never really been as high just due to everyone's worried about Brexit and it's worked out probably in our favour. The export market's uh, very good now and yeah, sheep, sheep's been working out well. They're averaging 250 at this time of year, so you're 40 kilos, you're 100 pound plus for a lamb at this time of year. Been very good up to now due to the fact the boys are early lambs, early lamb and they've got my way, they're not keeping to heavy weights, so they've got my way quite sharp and everyone's at, they've been a good trade right up to now and everyone's been hard at them and this maybe will not have the same August flush. If folk have not held them to 50 kilos, the early boys have got my weight at 40s and they're out of the system. And we've sold a, sold a hell of a lot more lambs at this time so far. So it's looking as it goes at the back end. Lambs that the blackie use and that might come out and might drop the averages in paper. But I think they've remained quite steady. I mean, it's not a numbers game. There's a great demand for sheep at the present moment. There's big numbers going through. We had 2,500 this week and Monday there. And then the following week we had 2,200 and they're still... They're still easy, very easy sold at the present moment. Supply, the demand is very good, but it's all a numbers game. If big numbers come out, they will drop. No substantially, but they'll still at 220, 230. Like, they'll not go down. I remember about my last year, they went down to 180, but last year was still a very good year. But they did have that two or three weeks of bad weather comes out, and then folk just offload them. They maybe, they maybe will drop, but I don't, I don't think it will will drop serious, but it will. Uh, as more numbers come out, they will, they will fairly they will drop off their back. So, uh, maybe down to 220, if it stays out there. The job by now, it can, everything's a, a good price to be honest at the present moment. You have got your Beltex lambs, and they're all, in continental lambs are always be easier sold, but even your, your even this time of year, I've seen this having blacky tups away, way in pay, and you can maybe struggle to get them away the last, at this time of year, but at the present moment, I can shift them fairly easily. There's no, not exactly begging them to take them. They're, they're wanting them you now, which is a surprise because that normally that meant many continental lambs kicking about you now, and they've got plenty to choose from. But as I said, they, yeah, there's not really a category at the present moment that's hard to sell. The key drivers resulting in the high prices are the export market and supply and demand with a lot less sheep on the hills due to ground being planted in forestry. At the peak, the spring lamb sale averaged 280 to 290 pence per kilogram at air market. So what's Drew's forecast for the store lamb and breeding sheep trade? In a July now, our first sale is the of breeding sheep is the 19th of August, so we've still got another three weeks, but it's no long coming round. Like, and the first store lamb sale will be the the 12th of August, so it's a week of four. But yeah, the forecast for that's fairly promising. As I said, the fat's up there, so yeah, the store lambs last year were 70 odd pounds above this year, they're talking maybe 85 and above. There's that much ground going for planting as well. The breeding sheep came from the hill ground the least over over the blackie and it's just going to create more demand if there's more planting ground going for planting there's going to be less sheep and the lowland boys will struggle to get the the replacements but basically which is going to be it's going to be good for the sheep because there's going to be less sheep supply and demand it's an old saying but it's very true do you think the good spring prices will affect the breeding gimme trade do you see certain breeds becoming more popular oh definitely if any was big and plainer types and thought it would be hard to go as gimmers. It was a no-brainer, especially continental types, folk keeping texel crosses. Keep them as gimmers, but if they're getting £130, £40 from the spring, it was a, a no-brainer just to sell them. Mm. So, yeah, so that will help the gimmer market as well. 
but I mean, we've not had a gimmer sale yet, but there's forecasts of the range between 180 to 200 pounds. The way it works out in this area, anyway, it's mostly black face, and over to the Lista, and then you produce your Scotch Mule, which I find personally is hard to beat. The Scotch Mule in this area it seems to work with plenty of lambs, quality lambs, and relatively easy care. But you've got other breeds as well that are coming on with the Cheviot. You've got your Aberfield to go over that to produce a mule as well, but as I said, um, I think in this area definitely there's a lot of the Scotch mule over the Texel, Bell Tex, Suffolk for your early lambs as well, for terminal sires, and I think if you keep it simple it generally works with sheep, I think. So what about the export market? There's a lot of lambs getting exported and there's no, no been any change at the present moment, but as the world market for lambs, very expensive on the continent as well. Stuff in New Zealand, Australia, it's all going elsewhere. The world market for for, uh, for sheep. I have it for lambs, all very good. So uh, even as well as beef as well. It's maybe cheap, uh, food's been too cheap for too long. Maybe. Eastern countries have definitely more money about them, and that's they're buying more protein products. So lamb and beef, it's a lot more going. It's a fairly dense population in China. And uh, in Japan, and they're definitely uh, eating more bo uh, protein based diets, and that's coming from New Zealand and Australia. So, there's as I said, everything's everything can get shifted quick across the world nowadays, and it is a world market that we're, we're on. We have to compete. What advice would you give to farmers selling finished lambs? If I go um, below kind of 210, say that way per kilo, uh, we're probably in the front foot. A lot of boys have been at them, they've taken them down to 40 kilos and if they do get cheaper, just, they've got the three weeks you can hold on to them, make them scarce again and then when they get, when they're squealing for lambs again, you've got them sitting there 45 kilos away. So, uh, but nobody's really holding on to them now because of that expense of folk getting them out of the system. So that's the sheep, but what about the cattle market? Yeah, again, it's sheep and like beef as well, farm gate prices have been never been as high. So they have just with been COVID and different sections. So as everyone's at home, nobody's going abroad. Yes, everything seems to, there's a, a definitely a demand for, for meat in general. We were selling uh, store cattle today. So it's ranging about from eight months old to, to 30 months old. So you've got small stuckies for farmers to buy for long term and then you've got bigger store cattle there, just short finishing um, boys just to finish them off. I think like so today, I think all categories are very easy sold, there's plenty of farmers and local farmers there to buy the stuckies to run on and then as I said today there was just plenty of buyers there for the, the bigger cattle as well, just for this kind of five, 480 to 550 kilos. Hopefully if you push them on now you'll get them for the Christmas market, so like so then they're, they're, they're very easy sold today, the stronger cattle. If everyone gets a good harvest and the fat cattle's round about that 410 to 420 dead weight, I can, I can see it being very good for farmers, um, especially the calves as well. There's, it's, it's looking fairly promising. And if we've got a good harvest as well, plenty of straw, plenty of grain, fat cattle's fairly good as well. So everyone, I think everyone's going to get a good turn. Do you see the Aberdeen Angus premium staying? It lights to the now, it's the same again. It's supply and demand. It's, if they've got contract for uh, for Anguses and there's plenty of Anguses about, it will just get short at the base price. So, like so now, I think it's maybe six or eight pence premium. Which I've seen it a lot, lot more than that. But it's just as I said, if they start getting scarce, and the, the wholesalers will need to supply, say the supermarkets, and there's, as I said, if they're short of Anguses, they'll bump the price up the premium. But as again, you'll probably need to do your research with CTS and see how many Anguses are getting registered. And, it's always the same, it's, it's, all, it's a supply and demand. Finally, what advice would you give to farmers presenting cattle at the market this autumn? Like so this time of year, if you've got them, give them a wee bit of feeding, so it is, get them looking as best you can. So it is, uh, even two kilos at this time of year, we're talking autumn, if you want to sell them October, a couple of kilos a day goes a long way with them, it just gives a bit of shine and fills them out a bit. So it is, especially when the weather does turn, it's very dry now, but it will come wet. It just saves the flesh on if you give them a wee bit of feeding this time of year.
For more information, please visit faz.scot. Next time on Faz TV, we focus on diversification, including everything from charcuterie to rapeseed oil and entertainment for all the family. Music